Okay. So All right. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Hi, I'm Aziza Streffy, and today I'll be presenting on behalf of the knee joint. I'm sorry I'm, I'm unable to give this presentation via Zoom. I've had a long-awaited orthodontics appointment. So without further ado, let's get into the knee joint. So the knee joint is one of the strongest and most important joints in the human body. It is the largest joint in the body, and the knee joint is a synovial hinge joint formed between three bones, including the femur, tibia, and patella. And then we have the tibia, which is medial, and it holds most of the weight, and it's on the left side right here in the green color. And then we have the patella, which is in the middle with the highlighted blue circle. And it's a type of sesamoid bone, and that is a type of short bone, as we discussed in previous lectures. And it is inserted in the quadriceps and patellar tendon. And then we have the fibula, which is in the yellow, which is in the left side. And that is attachment for the knee joint structures, and it doesn't articulate with the femur or the patella. And then we have enlarged femoral condyles, which articulate on the enlarged tibial condyles. And then we also have medial and lateral tibial condyles, which are receptacles for the femoral condyles, which um, essentially means they hold up the femoral condyles. Then we have the vastus lateris, vastus intermedius, and vastus medialis, and those originate from the proximal femur and then insert onto the patellar superior pole, and we can see that on the left image over here. And then we have the sartorius, gracilius, and semitendinous, and those insert below the medial condyle on the upper anterior medial tibial surface. And the first one we see is the sartorius, and then the second would be the gracilius, and then the third would be the semitendinosus. And you can see their insertions below in each one of those. And then we have the popliteus, which is the fourth image, and that originates on the lateral aspect of the lateral femoral condyle. And then we have the tibial collateral originates on the medial part of the upper medial femoral condyle, and then it inserts on the medial tibial surface, and its insertion is essentially on the tibial tuberosity via the patel, patel tendon. Next, we have the medial meniscus, and it's attached to the anterior intercondoid fossa of the tibia, and its posterior end is attached to the posterior intercondoid fossa of the tibia and its lateral meniscus is circular and covers a large portion of the articular surface. And its anterior end is attached to the intercondyle eminence of the tibia and is continuous with the anterior cruciate ligament, which we'll get into much more detail later. And it's either one or both of the meniscus can be uh, torn in different areas, which can lead to a plethora of different problems. And those tears usually occur due to major compression during rotation, while flexing or extending it would during quick directional changes. Next, we have the anterior cruciate ligament, otherwise known as ACL, and it's on the left side over here. And it's attached to the depression in front of the intercondyl eminence of the tibia, and it passes upward, backward, and laterally to insert into the lateral condyle of the femur. And on the right side, we have the posterior cruciate ligament, otherwise known as PCL, and it's not often injured, and it's stronger but shorter and less oblique than the anterior cruciate ligament, and it's attached to the posterior intercondyl fossa of the tibia and to the posterior extremity of the lateral meniscus. Next, we have the medial collateral ligament, which is on the left side, and it is a broad flat band, which we could see that, and it's attached above to the medial condyle and below to the medial condyle and medial surface of the body of the tibia. Then on the right side, we have the lateral collateral ligament, and it's strong fibrous cord attached above to the lateral condyle of the femur and below to the lateral side of the head of the fibula. Next, we have some bony landmarks. Some of these we are familiar with from previous labs and lectures. So to start off with, we have the medial and lateral epicondyles, and those are gonna be on the left side. We see the red is gonna be the lateral condyle, and then the highlighted blue would be the lateral epicondyle. And then that purplish color would be the medial condyle, and then the highlighted blue would be the medial epicondyle. 
And then we have Gertie's tubercle, which is in the center, highlighted in green, and it's above. You can see the tube, tib tibial tuberosity, and it's going to be a sooth facet on the lateral aspect of the upper part of the tibia and below the knee joint and adjacent to the proximal tibiofibular joint. And it is the point of insertion for the elliptical band of the lateral thigh. And then on the far right side, we have the tibial tuberosity, and that is an elevation on the proximal anterior aspect of the tibia. And the anterior tibial tuberosity gives attachment to the patellar ligament, and the posterior surface gives attachment to the posterior cruciate ligament. And the tibial tuberosity is a highlighted blue part in the far right image. And then again, we have those medial and lateral condyles of the tibia, which would include the gray and red pieces above the tibial tuberosity. And the medial portion is the upper extremity of the tibia, and the lateral condyle is the lateral portion of the upper extremity of the tibia. So some general movements uh, within the knee joint, we have flexion, which is bending or decreasing angle between the femur and the leg. We have extension, which is straightening of increasing angle between the femur and lower leg. And then external rotation, which would include rotary movement of leg lateral laterally away from midline. And then internal rotation, rotary movement of the lower leg medially toward the midline. So there's two types of muscle groups in, within the knee joint. We have the hamstring muscle groups. These are going to include the bicep femoris, semimembranosus, and semitendinosus. And this includes knee flexion, and they're located in the posterior section of the thigh. And the popliteus muscle assists the medial hamstring and knee internal rotation. And then we have the quadricep femoris muscle group, and these include the vastus lateralis, vastus intermedius, vastus medialis, and rectus femoris. And this includes extending the knee and located in the anterior section of the thigh. And then we have knee extensor muscles, and these include the popliteus, gastrocnemius, sartorius, and gracilius. And we'll get into much more detail about each, in, each individual muscle in upcoming slides. So first up, we have the hamstring muscles, and this would include the bicep femoris, and this is a hamstring muscle in the posterior section of the thigh, and that assists in movements of the hip, thigh, knee, and lower leg. It consists of two heads. The long head is the lateral portion, and the short is the medial portion. Its origin is the ischial tuberosity, and it shares a common tendon with the semitendinosus and semimembranosus. Its insertion includes the lateral surface of the head of the fibula. Its innervation is the tibial nerve S01 through S03. Its action is the flexion and lateral rotation of the lower leg at the knee joint and extension of the thigh at the hip joint. And the blood supply for all three hamstring muscles is roughly the same. It includes perforating branches of profunda femoris and inferior gluteal artery. Next, we have the semimembraniosis, and this is a muscle in the posterior section of the thigh and is the deepest of the hamstring muscles. Its origin is ischial tuberosity, and it shares a common tendon with the semitendinosus and bicep femoris. Its insertion is the posterior surface of the medial condyle of the tibia. Its innervation is the tibial nerve L05 through S02. Its action is flexes the leg at the knee joint, rotates the leg medially, and its blood supply is the perforating branches of profunda femoris and inferior gluteal artery. Next, we have the semitendinosus, and this is one of the hamstrings and is a muscle of the posterior section of the thigh. It is also one of the three muscles of the pest and meristinus. And the pest and meristinus is technically called like the goose foot, and it refers to the conjoined tendons of the three muscles that insert into the anteromedial surface of the proximal tibia. And the origin of the semitendinosus includes the ischial tuberosity, and it shares a common tendon with the semimembranosus and bicep femoris. And its insertion is a medial surface of the superior shaft of the tibia via a common tendon of the pest and meristinus. And its innervation is a tibial nerve L05 through S02. Its action includes flexes the leg at the knee joint and rotates the leg medially. And its blood supply is perforating branches of profunda femoris and inferior gluteal artery. Now getting into the quadricep muscles, these would include the vastus lateralis, and this is the muscle of the thigh, and it's the largest and most lateral of the quadriceps in the anterior section. And its origin is the greater trochanter and upper lateral surface of the linus barrier. Its insertion is the patella via the quadriceps tendon and the tibial tuberosity via the patellar ligament. 
Its innervation is the femoral nerve L0 2 through L04. Its action includes extension of the leg at the knee joint. And again, the blood supply within the quadriceps are roughly going to be the same. So it's the lateral circumflex femoral artery. Next, we have the vastus intermedius, and this is a muscle in the anterior section of the thigh and is located immediately below the rectus femoris. Its origin is the upper two-thirds of the anterior and lateral surface of the femur, and its insertion is the common tendon of the quadriceps enclosing the patella and inserting on the tibial tuberosity. Its innervation is the femoral nerve L02 through L04. Its action includes extension of the leg at the knee joint, and the blood supply is the lateral circumflex femoral artery. And then we have the vastus medialis, and this is the most medial, medial of quadriceps in the anterior section of the thigh. Its origin is the intertrochanter line and medial line of the line asperia. Its insertion is the patella via the quadriceps tendon, tibial tuberosity via the patellar ligament. And then its innervation is the femoral nerve L02 through L04, and its action includes extension of the leg at the knee joint. And its blood supply would include femoral artery, profunda femoris, superior medial ganglion branch of popliteal artery. Next, we have the rectus femoris, and this is the most anterior muscle of the anterior section of the thigh. Its origin is the anterior inferior iliac spine in a groove superior to the acetabulum. And its insertion is the common tendon of the quadriceps, enclosing the patella and inserting on the tibial tuberosity. Its innervation is the femoral nerve L02 through L04, and its action includes extension of the leg at the knee joint and flexion of the hip. Its blood supply includes the lateral circumflex femoral artery. Now getting into the knee extensor muscles, so first we have the popliteus, and this is a deep muscle in the posterior section of the leg that assists in movements of the knee and lower leg. Its origin is the lateral surface of the lateral condyle of the femur. Its insertion is the posterior surface of the proximal tibial shaft. Its innervation is the tibial nerve L04 through S01, and its action includes medial rotation of the lower leg at the knee joint, flexion of the lower leg at the knee joint, and the blood supply is the popliteal artery. Next, we have the gastrocnemius, and this is the superficial two-headed muscle of the posterior section of the leg, and one of the two muscles that make up the tricep serrae. Its origin is the medial and lateral heads that arise from the posterior surface of the respective femoral condyles. And its insertion is the posterior surface of the cal calcinus by way of the Achilles tendon. And its innervation would be the tibial nerve S01 through S02. And its action would include plantar flexion of the foot and it flexes the leg at the knee joint. And its blood supply is the surreal arteries and posterior tibial artery. Next, we have the sartorius, and this is a muscle in the anterior section of the thigh, and this is in the movements of the th hip, thigh, knee, and lower leg. Its origin is the anterior superior iliac spine, and its insertion is the medial surface of the superior shaft of the tibia via common tendon of the pes aneurysmus. Its innervation would be the femoral nerve L02 through L03. And its action includes flexion, abduction, and lateral rotation of the thigh at the hip joint, and flexion and medial rotation of the lower leg at the knee joint. And its blood supply would be the profunda femoris and saphenous branch of the descending gen genicular artery. And then we have, lastly, the gracilius, and this is going to be the most superficial muscle in the medial section of the thigh, and it assists in movements of the hip, thigh, knee, and lower leg. Its origin is the lower half of the pubic symphysis and upper half of the pubic arch. Its insertion is the medial surface of the superior shaft of the tibia via a common tendon of the pes aneurysmus. And its innervation is the up obturator nerve L03 through L04. Its action is adduction and flexion of the thigh at the hip joint and flexion and medial rotation of the lower leg at the knee joint. Its blood supply is the obturator artery. So some common diseases and injuries that are related with the knee joint. First, we have osteoarthritis, and the image on the left side would be a normal knee joint. And then on the right, we have when osteoarthritis comes into play. You can see those two different images depicting. 
So osteoarthritis is caused by joint damage and which can accumulate over time and age is one of the main causes of the joint damage leading to osteoarthritis. And treatments can vary are usually can vary and depend on the affected joint and it usually involves exercise and medication. Next, we have the most common injury of the knee joint. So we have the ACL injury, also known as the anterior cruciate ligament injury. And as we can see in the upper left side, this is a normal ACL. And then on the right is when the injury occurs. And the ACL injury is commonly occurred during sports that involves sudden stops or changes in direction, jumping and landing. And many people hear or feel a pop in the knee when the injury occurs and treatments um, range, but they usually include rest and rehab exercises to help regain strength and stability. Lastly, I do have an activity on eLearn that puts all of the information from my PowerPoint into a simple quiz. So I hope you find my um, PowerPoint to be informative and thank you so much. Okay. Um, let's see. So I want to uh, go over some of the things for the lab today, which is on the knee. And I think I will pull up the homework so that I remember what things I want to focus on. Because I know we've got a couple different questions today than what you normally would have. Here we go. All right, all of this should be, um, that was covered in the presentation. So again, one thing to remember when we think about these actions is I want you to focus on the actions just at the knee joint. So for example, um, when we look at rectus femoris, when we look at these hamstring muscles, they're biarticular. So they're going to have an action at both the knee and the hip. However, just focus on what's going on at the knee joint for this particular unit. Um, oh, okay. Labeling different components associated with the knee. Um, again, covered pretty much all of these within the um, presentation. I'm trying to think if there's anything that I want to kind of focus on. I think those are all good. Number four, notice that I'm asking you to compare and contrast what's going on on the medial side of the knee with the lateral side of the knee in detail. Okay, um, so again, think about what muscles cross which side. So when we look at the lateral side, for example, um, I have biceps femoris, I have vastus lateralis, I've got the IT band is going to cross over on this side. Um, so again, thinking about those lateral muscles and the amount of stability that they're providing. Then when we look at the medial side of the uh, joint, Again, look at the, the bony arrangement here. It's pretty darn open, right? So basically you have these two um, kind of like troughs and then you're just going to set a bone on top of it. So we've got to have strong um, muscles crossing the joint in every, like on every side. And then also the strength of these ligaments, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail, um, is pretty important in order for us to prevent knee injuries. Okay, so on the medial side, again, um, muscles to think about, we've got the semimembranosus, semitendinosus, uh, sartorius, gracilis, vastus medialis is on this side. So again, think about all those muscles when you go to talk in detail about um, what's on which side. Okay, when we look at the bony ar arrangement, again, we know the fibula, think about the bony, um, uh, the bony landmarks that we see on either side as well. And then on that medial side, um, again, what are the bony landmarks that are kind of surrounding this um, particular area? 
Uh, other things to kind of compare and contrast, and again, you'll want to kind of look into this a little bit, is like what's the difference between the, the medial and the lateral um, meniscus, right? So the meniscus are basically like these little like cup, like think of them as like they're making this little trough a little bit deeper. And so again, the idea is they're providing us some stability as these condyles from the femur like sit inside of these little like divots basically, okay? Um, so there are some differences when you go to look into, you know, the medial meniscus versus the lateral meniscus. So um, do look into that and then mention that in your question number four. Um, other things to note, again, ACL versus PCL, wanted to kind of compare and contrast those two ligaments. So um, again, PCL, you can see here, and then the ACL, you can just see a little snippet of over here. And um, again, when we think about injury rates, comparing and contrasting ACL versus PCL, um, ACL injuries are generally going to be non-contact. And ACL, um, its job is to help prevent the tibia from sliding out in front of the femur. So again, if I am, for example, I'm um, playing soccer and I'm running and I need to change direction quickly. Um, again, the ACL's job is to help us with that rotary stability. So giving us the stability to plant my foot and be able to move um, without the tibia sliding in front of my femur. So again, the majority of ACL tears that we see are going to be non-contact. So nobody like ran into you or anything. You just tried to change direction quickly and that ligament didn't hold the tibia where it was supposed to be in comparison to the femur. Um, again, I'm, I'm super interested in ACL injuries. Um, I worked with our women's soccer team this fall and did an ACL um, tear prevention program for them uh, because it's such a such a big concern for a lot of female athletes but um, again most people that are um, the highest risk for ACL tears are female athletes uh, in sports such as soccer and basketball and the reason for that is again I'm doing a lot of cutting right so I have to run in this direction then I'm going to plant and try and turn and move my uh, momentum in a different direction depending on what's going on in that play or whatever so we see a lot of ACL tears in that particular um, arena now the PCL much less of an issue when it comes to injuries however when I do injure my PCL, it's because somebody hit me, okay? So again, if I have a, a PCL injury, it's going to be a contact injury, okay? So again, maybe I got hit in the knee, maybe I got hit in the femur, so I might see something like that. And uh, football, for example, would be, would be a common place for us to see that. So again, when we think about the differences for injuries, ACL, generally non-contact. PCL is going to be um, a contact type of injury. One other thing to kind of um, differentiate when we look at the medial versus the lateral side. I brought my little model today. So again, a little hard for you guys to see, but here's the medial, the MCL, okay? Here's the LCL, okay? Again, hard for you to really get this visual clearly, but can you see the difference in size? See how thick the medial is in comparison to the lateral? See that difference? Guesses as to why a medial side needs to be thicker than the lateral side. Any thoughts on that? Anybody? For protection, like the kneecap. Well, the kneecap's going to be kind of in front. You're right, it is for protection. But the kneecap's going to be pretty, it's pretty good just because it's got, um, you know, some strong muscles crossing over here. Other thoughts on why the medial side needs to be thicker than the lateral side? Does the medial side like come in more contact with more stuff? Yeah. Again, Marcus, you play football, yeah? Yeah, I tore my uh, MCL and uh, basically almost all my ligaments in my knee this season. 
the unhappy triad is that what you had yeah it was a non-contact yeah okay so again um in a sport like football for example if i'm going to tackle somebody it's more likely that i'm going to hit them on the outside it would be hard for me to get on the inside of their knee because again I, if i want to take them down right i need to get their whole body not just one leg right so again it's more likely that i'm going to hit from the outside so if i hit on this side again look at the strain that that's going to place on that medial side right the medial side is supposed to help keep that femur tight to the tibia so if i put some tension on this side you can see without me actually breaking my model because i've done that once that this is gets really tight right so that can become a major issue okay so again when you think about protection this medial side needs to be stronger than the lateral side and again that's not good enough we still see way 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 more injuries on the medial side than what we would see on the lateral side it's certainly possible to have this happen if i got hit on the inside of my knee but much less likely than me getting hit on the outside and having to you know deal with that type of abrasion okay um questions on the knee setup again um kind of gave you most of the things i'm looking for on that so again think about the ligaments the bony landmarks um the cartilage as well associated with with the knee joint again look at the difference between the mcl and the lcl and then also just appreciate how much more tension we're in a place on that medial side in comparison to the lateral side, which is why this side needs to be stronger, um, but that isn't always enough if we're doing a lot of, you know, high contact types of things. Uh, okay, those, the agonist stuff, you're good. Okay, so check this out. Knee joint, push up. What, what position am I in? What position is my knee in when I do a push up? extension yes it's an extension okay is it an extension in both the lift phase and the lowering phase yeah. yes okay so that tells us that the type of contraction must be what i'm having no change in movement isometric yep isometric okay so extension isometric and then you can figure out what muscles and again do a push-up where do you feel it do you feel it on the front side of your legs or the back side of your legs um, i think that's the nice thing about like anatomy and muscles is like you have them so just use them and use that as a tool for you um, to kind of figure out problem solve some of these things okay again when you think about squats and cycling focus on what's going on at the knee joint Okay. Um, again, I don't know, this kind of trips some people up sometimes. So let me show you what I mean when I talk about cycling. Let's see. Can you see me back behind my desk? Or do I need to move? I better move over here. Okay. So again, when I'm cycling, lift phase, lower phase. Let me move that down a little so you can see better. Okay, so lift phase, lower phase. So I'm basically going like this when I cycle, okay? So what's going on when I lift? Flexion. Flexion, and then when I extend, or I'm sorry, <laughs> when I lower, I'm extending, right? So again, think about when you're cycling, what's the hard part? Is it the lifting part or is it the pushing down part? Okay, and use that as a guide for you to kind of figure out, um, you know, which portion is concentric which portion is eccentric questions on the lab nope okay we have one more presentation on lower extremity um musculature so i'm going to get that pulled up here i thought i already had it open yeah i do okay um do i need to do a new share yeah i do all right, here we go. Okay, so I'm gonna be discussing the lower extremity muscles. First, we have our hip muscles. To start off with posterior, we have the gluteus maximus, gluteus minimus, gluteus medius, the 
uh, biceps, foramus, uh, semi membranosus, semi tendinosus, and the uh, pisiformis. And for anterior, we have the, I'm going to butcher some of these names, so just bear with me. The iliopsos. Okay, and the tensor. Oh, goodness gracious. Fascia. And then the rectus foramus. And then the vastus muscles. All right, for the gluteus maximus, it's the biggest of the three gluteal muscles. It also makes up more of the rounder shape of the glutes. The origin is the surface of the ilium. The intersection is the greater trochanter of the femur. And the iliotibial tract. Um, the actions include external rotation, extension of the hip joint, and it supports the knee when it's extended, and it's also the chief anti-gravity muscle when seated. The antagonist of this muscle is the iliacus, and then the, I can never pronounce this word, the psoasis, major and minor. Okay, now on to gluteus minimus. This is the three, or this is the smallest of the three of the gluteal muscles. The origin is under the, glute the gluteal medius. The intersection is the greater trochanter of the femur. Actions include a abdu oh gosh. abduction of the hip. It prevents abduction of the hip and medial rotation of the thigh. The antagonist is the lateral rotator rotator group. And gluteus medius. This is a broad and thick muscle of the glute. Um, its origin is under the gluteus maximus and the gluteal surface of the ilium. Um, for intersection, the, it intersects at the greater trochanter of the femur also. And the actions include abduction of the hip, medial and internal rotation and flexion of the hip. Extension and lateral external rotation of the hip. Um, and the antagonist is a ductus. The bicep foramus. Um, this is a muscle of the thigh and it makes up part of the hamstring. The origin is the femur. The intersection is at the head of the fibula. The actions for this muscle are it flexes the knee joint, laterally rotates the knee joint, and it also extends the hip joint. The antagonist for this is the quad muscles. So your hamstrings on the back, like the back part of your leg, so for this one, the antagonist is like the front part of your leg. Semi-membranosus. It is the most medial out of the three muscles. And that also makes up the hamstring. Um, the origin is the ischial tub tuberosity. The intersection is the medial condyle of the, tib the tibia. Actions include extension of the hip and flexion of the knee. And the antagonist is also the quad muscles.
Okay, it's the mind tendinosis. It's the middle muscle of the hamstring. The origin is the lower part of the, ischi the ischium. The intersection is at the tibia. And actions include flexion of the knee and extension of the hip joint. And then again, the antagonist is the quad muscles. All right, pisiformes is one of the six muscles that make up the lateral rotator group. The origin is the sacrum. The intersection is the greater trochanter. And actions include external rotator of the thigh. And then for this one, I could not find an antagonist. Um, the ilio psoas is it's the strongest of the hip flexors. The origin is the iliac fossa and the lumbar spine. The intersection is the iliolumbar artery. It actions include flexion of the hip. And the antagonist is the gluteus maximus. The tensor fasce. Okay, it's another muscle that helps make up the thigh. Um, the origin is the anterior superior iliac spine. The intersection is the greater trochanter. And actions include hip flexion, medial rotation, abduction, lateral rotation of the knee, and it also helps stabilize your torso. And also for this one, I could not find an antagonist. All right, rectus femoris. This helps make up our quad muscles. The origin is the anterior inferior iliac spine. The intersection is the patellar tendon. Actions include knee extension and hip flexion. And the antagonist is the hamstring. Uh, vastus muscles. These three muscles help make up the quadricep muscles. Um, the origin of these three muscles is the femur. The intersection is the quadricep tendon. The actions of these muscles are extension of the knee joint and no antagonist was found. All right, now moving to the knee joint muscles, we have Simba, semimembranosis, semitendinosis, biceps femoris, the gastrocnemius, vastus muscles, and rectus femoris. And since I've been over almost all of these, I think, except for gastrocnemius, well, I'm not going to repeat them. All right, the gastrocnemius is a three joint muscle, so it helps the knee, the ankle, and the subtalar joints. The origin is the femur. The intersection is the calcaneus. And actions for this muscle is flexion of the knee. The antagonist is the tibialis anterior muscle. And now moving on to the ankles and toe muscles. We have the gastrocnemius, the soleus, flexor digitorum longus, tibialis posterior, tibialis anterior, extensor digitorum longus, and fibularis, fibularis longus and brevis. So starting off, we have solace, 
This is your calf muscle and is the most powerful muscle located on the lower back side of your leg. The origin is the fibula. Intersection is the calcaneus. Then actions for this muscle is plantar flexion. And the antagonist is the tibialis anterior. All right, flexor digitorum longus. This muscle curves, is like able to move your second, third, fourth, and fifth toe. The origin is the tibia. The intersection is the plantar surface. And then actions, you get to, you're like, you're able to flex the four smaller toes. And then the antagonist is the extensor digitorum longus and brevis. Okay, tibialis posterior. It helps stabilize the lower leg. The origin is the tibia and the fibula. The intersection is at the navicular bone. Then actions, it's inversion of the foot in the plant and plantar flexion of the front and ankle. The antagonist is fibularis longus and brevis. And tibialis anterior, the origin is also the tibia. And then intersection is the first metatarsal bone. Actions include dorsiflexion and inversion of the foot. And the antagonist is fibularis longus and the gastrocnemius. Extensor digitorum longus. For the origin, it's at the anterior shaft of the fibula. The intersection is the dorsal surface. Actions include extension of the toes and dorsiflexion of the ankle. The antagonist is flexor digitorum longus and brevis. All right, fibularis longus. The origin is the fibula. The intersection is at the first metatarsal. The action include plantar flexion, eversion, and it also supports your arches on your foot. The antagonist is the tibialis anterior muscle. All right, fibularis brevis. The origin is at the fibula. The intersection is at the fifth metatarsal. Actions include plantar flexion and inversion. And I could not find an antagonist for this muscle. All right. So two related diseases or injuries. I kind of went basic and chose a strained hamstring and a torn hamstring. For the strained hamstring, like a strained hamstring is when you stretch the muscles in the back of your thigh too far and it results in pain. The best way to help with this injury is the rice method. The rice method. And if you don't know what that is, it's you rest, ice, compress, and elevate your leg or the hurt area. And then going farther than that, than just like a strain, you also have a torn muscle. So you can tell you have a torn muscle when you're using it and it's not only painful, but you also hear a popping noise. You may also see some bruising in that area. And also the best way to help with this injury would also be the rice method. Uh, questions from anybody on the knee joint or the endocrine system, which we went should have covered on Friday for your lecture. Anything? Anybody out there? Um, again, hang in there. It's our last week here. Um, I will. T I will tell you the the last three lectures that you have are pretty in depth. 
Um, so I would, I mean, if, if you have time, maybe you could do two today and one tomorrow and that way you have Wednesday to kind of study because then you have that lecture exam is on Thursday, right? Um, so again, those last three are pretty, I don't know, they're three of the tougher, I think, um, just a lot of information and that sort of thing. So um, if you can get two of them done today, that might be helpful. Anything else? Anybody? No? That's all I have for today. Wednesday will be our last Zoom session. We'll have the ankle and foot. And then, um, like I said, lecture exam is Thursday. And then the lab practical is on Friday. Um, again, I know on the calendar it's listed as 8.30 to 9.30, but I'll open that up so it's 8.30 to 1 or 8 to 1 or something like that, if that's better for you guys. Um, I don't like them to go past one because I like to get them graded before I pick up my son from daycare. So um, if I have from like one till three or so to, to get those graded and look at those, that's helpful for me. So that's my story on that. Um, if there's no other questions, I'll let you guys go for the day. Have a great Monday and I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Bye. Bye. Bye.